Dr. Miles Monroe is with me today, and I'm so glad he is, and he'll be here tomorrow and Wednesday. He just wrote a book on overcoming crisis, and anytime he writes a book, I get very excited because you have so much to tell the church. I mean, your teaching on the kingdom is, there's nothing like it. Thank you. You are tops. And I see USA Today, best-selling author, sir. Yes. Wow. Thank God. It's yes, good to sir. be back. Well, it's <laughs> nice to have you back. Let's begin talking about overcoming crisis. Now, what, what do you mean by crisis? Financial, global, our crisis with family, or all you the know, above? The whole world today is talking about crisis. Yeah. And, uh, of course, uh, this is a global crisis. As a matter of fact, I think that the real crisis in the world today is globalization. Because historically... What do you mean by globalization? I mean, uh, let me explain right now. Please, sir. Historically, when a country had an economic problem, it was simply that country's problem. So you go back as far as the 1930s when the Great Depression took place, uh, you know, there were isolated experiences of depression around the world. If the economic conditions in one country fall apart, it didn't affect other nations. But today, because the whole world is so interdependent, when something happens in any country, it affects all the countries. For example, the present global crisis economically taking place was purported to have been started by some decision makers in the field of real estate in the United States. And it ended up impacting France, Germany, Italy, London, and now all the world. But now, words, why, why did you write this book? This book was written because people are beginning to panic. And crisis is any situation, circumstance, or condition that affects your environment and your life over which you have no control. People, for example, watching this program, many of your partners, they're losing their jobs, losing their houses, losing their 401ks. They are losing their savings. They are having to abandon their businesses. And, be, and they have no control over it. And so they feel like the whole world is imploding on them. And that's called a crisis. Well, in this book, I wanted to show that a crisis is not as negative as you think it is. Whenever God wanted to do something powerful or great, he didn't only look for crises, he created them. For example, when God wanted to promote... God created crisis. Yes. Matter of fact, the word crisis is a word that we created. We use it to, des to describe things we cannot understand or cannot control. We invented the word crisis. Uh, God never calls anything a crisis. So our semantics, our terminologies are the problem. For example, in this book, I talk about the fact that whatever you call a thing, that is what it is to you. So if you call it a crisis, then it controls your response to it. In the word of God, God never calls anything a crisis. Case in point, let's think about Daniel and the lion's den. If you were threatened today to be thrown into a cave of wild lions, you would call that a crisis. But God was relaxed because God set up the whole thing. He actually designed the whole environment for Nebuchadnezzar and all of that to prove that you can turn lions into a sleeping mat. <laughs> Another thing about a crisis, the only thing you are known for in life are the things you overcame. Boy, that is Crisis powerful. is the recording of history. Let me put it another way. History is a record of crisis. You only know people because of crisis. Martin Luther King Jr., we know him because of the crisis he went through. Nelson Mandela, it was the crisis. These are unknown people without crisis. Let's go back to Abraham. It was a crisis. Barron, not even have a child, that's a crisis. Uh, uh, how about uh, Daniel? How do we know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yeah. These were unknown exactly. Jewish boys, but a fiery furnace made them famous. This is the <laughs> hour true. right now where what you're going through, God has allowed it so that you can never be forgotten in history. 
you know, what made Jesus famous? It was a crisis. A cross That's became right. a crisis, and now we can't forget him. So crises are simply situations that either God created or God allows to prove that he is bigger than circumstances and to also make sure that history can't forget you. And how, what happens to the individual? You know, when a person faces a situation that we call a crisis, your interpretation of a crisis is what makes it a crisis. You know, Paul the Apostle said something important. Paul says, all things work together for my good. Yeah. Now, that sounds like a nice statement, but that's a tough statement. Someone just lost their job watching this program. They just got a pink slip, and they're supposed to say, this is working for my good. Well, if they don't understand how God uses crisis, it could become a point of depression. You know, I have a little list in the book. I talk about what crisis create. Uh, let's look at a few of them. Yeah, please. The loss of a job could be a crisis. The death of a child is a crisis. The death of a spouse, the collapse of a business, the, the, the terminal disease that's in a body is a crisis. Uh, a divorce, that's a crisis for someone. A loss of a home, a repossession by the bank, that's a crisis. An unmarried pregnant daughter could be a crisis to someone. A drug addict child, that's a crisis for someone. A death of a parent. In other words, crisis is not just economic conditions. It's anything that happens to you that you couldn't control or you couldn't stop. And what, what is the impact of a crisis? Fear, trauma, depression, despair, frustration, anxiety, loneliness, abandonment, worry, hopelessness, a sense of loss, even the threat of suicide. These are the impact of crisis on a person's body, on a person's life. Even crime and domestic violence are products of crisis. Many people today are under stress in their homes because if the husband lost his job, let's say, uh, you know, GM you know, shut down the plant, and the husband lost his job, he's the only one working, imagine the stress in that family, in that home. See, and you tell that person, well, believe in God. They need more than just belief in God. They need some practical uh, uh, principles and precepts to know what to do, and in this book, that's what we do. Then let's about. help many of them right now Absolutely. watching, please. You know, the first thing you got to understand about a crisis is that a crisis is only seasonal. I think one of the most beautiful things that God ever taught me is that nothing is forever except Him and His promises. Would you look at the camera and tell someone that who's going through some pain? Yes. You know, the joy of life is that God gives us life in doses. The Bible says as long as the earth remains, there'll be harvest and seed time. There'll be good time and bad time. There'll be summer and winter. And unlike what the scriptures say too, it says to everything there is a season. In other words, nothing lasts forever. If you are broke right now, that's only a season. It cannot last. Wealth is on the way. And if you are wealthy right now, you must use that wealth strategically and properly because there will come a time when that wealth may be challenged. In other words, everything is for a season. And the good thing is that if you are in a dungeon right now, light is on the way. If you are in pain right now, health is on the way. If you are abandoned right now, a company is coming to meet you. You see, nothing remains forever. And that's the joy Beautiful. of a crisis. Yeah. What, what you're going through right now cannot last. You know, it's amazing. Please say that again. I think somebody really needs to hear Absolutely. this one more time. Nothing in life lasts forever except God. This is why even, that's very even your marriage will go through seasons. You know, I tell people all the time, uh, if your husband or wife is not doing well right now, don't divorce them. Why? That's a temporary insanity. Oh, well, I said it again. They are going through a season of insanity. It can't last. Have you gone through that? Everyone in marriage goes through that. I've been married for 30 years this year, and it's been wonderful. Same here. And you know something? The issue in life is remaining steady until the season passes. Can I say it again? Yeah, please. The key to success in life is outlasting the season. And that could be a season of good time or bad time. Here's something I learned. I talk about it in the book. And that is the greatest protection against crisis is to expect it. Now, you may think that's negative. <laughs> I like that. Brother, you are blessing me right now. <laughs>
So we are to expect it. Well, let me put it this way. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Really tribulation. Yes. See, we love to claim selective promises. Yeah. And that's our problem. We, we, we like to claim things like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We claim things like, my God shall supply all my needs. Well, of course. We claim things like, whatever I put my hands to shall prosper. Well, claim this one. You shall suffer persecution. <laughs> Nobody ever claims That's that a promise. In this world, you shall suffer many tribulations. As a matter of fact, Jesus said something about Christ. He says, if you follow me in my kingdom, he says, and you believe my word, he promises now. He says, you will be like a man who built his house on a rock. The storm come, the winds blew, the waves rose, and the great clash hit the house yeah. and it stood firm he says if you don't follow my word it's like a man who built his house on the sand the winds blew the storms rose the waters came and that house fell which now, means uh, he was telling us hang on don't get ahead of me <laughs> see we who are in the kingdom it. of god we believe that we are immune to crisis yeah so we got a, someone listening to this program right now they're saying well I paid my tithes, I went to church, I was faithful, why did I lose my job? Well, he did say that the wind would hit all houses. Yeah, he did. Because you are a believer, doesn't, wow. doesn't insulate you from storms. But he does guarantee your house won't fall. Well, I tell you, you're ministering to me right now, so I'm listening to every word. So, the, the, the key is not whether you have a crisis or not, the key is what are you built on? Yeah, and absolutely. in this book I talk about you overcome crisis by making sure that you understand the principles and the precepts of God's word so that when the storms come, the storm doesn't come to destroy you. It comes to prove what you now built go on. back to what you said earlier. You expect it, you said. Yes. Okay. The greatest protection against disappointment is the but expectation may I ask of change. You, how many storms must we expect a year? <laughs> Listen, how many storms do you expect? One? I, I, I want one. I don't, I don't want two. I want one a year. You know, one of the things I believe... Actually, I don't really want any, but uh, if, know, if I'm supposed to have one, at least one a year, no more. You know, all of life is a series of crises. I like what the, the Asians do when they have a crisis. Do you ever wonder why the Chinese and the Japanese always emerge out of crisis victoriously? Second World War, the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. Right. The Japanese came back. They came out of, of ashes and became the most powerful exporters of technology and cars to so America. Why? The Chinese, every city you go into, you find that the Chinese always end up owning a business. Why? Because in the Japanese language and the Chinese language, there's no word for crisis. Really? As a matter of fact, the word for crisis in the Japanese language is the word opportunity. <laughs> wow. So when, so right now, in, look, look, look at the Chinese. I today. like that. The Chinese are traveling all over the world right now, and they are investing in all the countries while all the countries are saying crisis, crisis. They're saying opportunity, opportunity. So we're to change our mentality. Absolutely. And in the body of Christ, unlike what Jesus said, you know, when they told Jesus, Lazarus is dead, he says, oh, he's asleep. Now, whatever you call a thing, that's what it is to you. They say, he's dead. Christ says, he's asleep. What's the difference? If I say a person is dead, that means I cannot awake them. But if I say they are asleep, I can awake them. <laughs> so. This crisis you're going through right now, is simply asleep. You are coming out of this. God's going to bring us out of this crisis. We're going to be bigger than when we went into so it. So when you come out, yes. what happens? When you come out, the, your test, your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. Oh, that's strong. Say that again. Your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. So no matter how much you brag and how much faith you have, the test that you're going through now will prove it. Beautiful. And this is why in the body of Christ, whenever you make a confession, Jesus said it must be tested. I remember Peter told Jesus, I will never leave you. 
I will never forsake you. I'll die for you. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, you shouldn't yes. have said that. He said, Peter, Satan has now required you to be tested for the words you said. Is that why he said that to him? Satan has desired to... to sift you as yeah, wheat. I've always wondered about that. It is a principle. This is why when you, when you claim, I'm going to win a million souls to Jesus this year, Satan wakes up and says, I'm going to see if he means that. And he attacks your partners, he attacks your financial support, he attacks your staff, he attacks your family. Why? He's going to make sure, whether you believe that or not, whether it will stand, that you will still go after those souls. So whenever you make a confession in the body of Christ, you attract the testing of that confession. And this is why, and the, the, the problem with living in the kingdom of God is this. You cannot get things without confessing them. But when you confess them, they will be tested. Every true vision... That is so powerful. Yes. My Lord, that's powerful. So when we, we have to confess it. Absolutely. But when we confess it... It must be tested. It, it will be tested, yeah. yeah to see if so it's authentic. So the, the enemy is going to come and say, okay, fella, Absolutely. you said by stripes I'm healed. I'm going to really see if you... If and you this mean. is why sometimes people say to you and I, I was doing fine until I became a believer. And now I'm having all these problems. Well, the reason why I'm having those problems is because you, you decided to confess, I am following Christ. Jesus said, anyone who will live godly in Christ Jesus must suffer. But let me read a verse of scripture that we don't claim. John 16, verse 1. Jesus said these words. He says, these things I have spoken unto you, that you should not be offended when they happen. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he's doing God's service. These things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you before now so that when the time shall come, when they happen, you will remember that I told you that they were coming. These things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. Now, what he's saying is, look, I am telling you that crisis is coming so that when the crisis comes, you are not shocked. A lot of people are shocked today because they didn't expect crisis. Crisis, look, I'm telling you that crisis is coming so that when it comes, you won't be offended. Offended means to be depressed, to feel shocked. Sure. Wh whatever you expect will never depress you. You know, we're, we're almost out of time. Let me tell you what's in this book. What it takes to overcome a crisis. Seven ways to manage a crisis. Yes. Can, can, can we talk about that tomorrow? Yes. Overcoming seasons yes. of crisis. Yes. And I liked what you said that, you know, it's, it doesn't last forever. Thriving at times, in times of crisis. <laughs> Discovering life beyond your job. Oh maximizing the benefits of a crisis. What do you mean by that? You know, a lot of people are losing their jobs today. But you, but you were not born to be employed. You were born to be deployed. And when your job becomes more important than your work, you better never lose your job. What people have done in life is they, if they actually live for a job and they never find their work, your job is what you will what you are paid to do. Your work is what you were born to do. And so if someone finds So when you, you say work, you mean calling? Absolutely. Your gift. Yeah. Your gift is more important than your skill. Your skill is what they train you to do. Your gift is what you were born with. And a lot that of people powerful. today, five million people lost their jobs since January. And I'm telling you on this show today on Benny and Show, that God sent this ministry into your life to tell you right now that your job is not your life and your job is not your work. There's life after your job. Your job is what they pay you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. And if you lose your job, they can never take away your gift, your work. And your work is what makes you prosperous because your work is your gift. Oh, and the scripture fine. says that a man's gift makes room for him in the world, not a man's job, his gift. So if you are unemployed today because you lost your job, God is telling you today, find your work. Your work will sustain you when you lose your job. Your gift will sustain you when you lose your skill. 
And the kingdom of God follows the spirit of gifting. This is why what you were born to do is more important than what you were trained to do. Listen, we're going to continue tomorrow. There's one other thing in this book, 10 Ways to Rise Above Crisis. <gasps> Maybe we can d touch on this tomorrow. Yes. Um, dear Dr. Miles Monroe has donated a thousand books only to our ministry. Yes. There's only 1,000 of these. And of course, they're in bookstores too, or will be in bookstores, correct? This is the first place where they are being released publicly. Right here. this show right now. Okay. So your partners and those who want it, if they call in right now and make a commitment, as a matter of fact, to support this ministry, we're going to give this book to them as a token of our appreciation for their supporting the Ben Hinn ministry. That's so sweet of you. For $30, a gift of $30, we'll send this to you. And then you have another book. Both of them are brand new. The Principles and Benefits of Change. Yes. What's, what's in this one? Ooh, that's the one that deals with the fact that change is a blessing, not a curse. And that we should maximize change, not be afraid of change. Well, can, can we talk about this Absolutely. on Wednesday? Absolutely, yes. All right. Now listen, each for 30, both for 50. Call today. And this is, well now this book hasn't come out either yet. This is coming out at the end of the month, so they'll both be out this month. But this is the first place they can first get them. First place right they here. can get them right here. Okay. Call now. The number is on the screen. Do it right away. Oh, this is powerful. I am really enjoying listening to you. You are always such a blessing. Thank you. You, you, you are a very, ins you inspire people. Thank you. No, me too. I mean, I love listening to you. It's called God breath. Some to inspire means to breathe Some preachers God's are breath. boring. You're, you're, you're not boring at all. <laughs> I am really enjoying Dr. Miles Monroe. Whenever he comes, he blesses me all over. And I'm so glad he's here today talking about overcoming crisis. Yes. That was powerful yesterday. Thank Very you. It was powerful. a joy. And I want to continue today talking about uh, what do you mean, by the way, in your book... Yeah. Well, let me just read this. What it takes to overcome a crisis. Seven ways to manage a crisis. I want to talk about the ways to manage crisis quickly. Yesterday you said that the reason the Japanese and the Chinese, uh, you know... So resilient. Yeah, is because there is no... The well, concept. In yeah, and, and there, there is no word in their language for, for crisis. crisis it just says opportunity so yes. it's the way you see it really yes. but you said something very powerful crisis is seasonal yes and this is probably the most important thing about crisis uh, one of the things that have kept me very calm in life is when I was ignited by the truth written by the richest man that ever lived King Solomon King Solomon said to everything, there is a, only a season. To everything, there's only a season. You know, I repeat that over and over again in my books because we don't get it. Listen to him again. To everything, there's only a season. That means if you're going through a bad time right now in your life, that cannot last. Because everything only has a season. And you said something very powerful yesterday. You said, uh, we are to expect this is why crisis. Exactly. And that's really one way to overcome them, is expect yes. them because they're a part of life. You know, this is why people become depressed. Depression is a result of the expectation that things will never change. Oh, how true that is. If you are able to expect change and then prepare to manage it when it comes, change will never catch you off guard and destroy you. Can we talk about managing? Yes. Now, in your book, this you say seven important. ways, seven ways to manage a crisis. Yes. Give, me, give me just some. Seven ways. In this book, in chapter uh, seven, we talk about how to manage crisis. Pastor Benny, first of all, I believe that the reason God created man was for management. Really? Well, <laughs> I've never, I have never heard it put that way. <laughs> when I read 
the Bible, people normally think I'm reading a different Bible. Let me read what was on God's mind when he made you. And I think this will help you go into this economic crisis right now. In the book of Genesis, I'm going to show you a verse you never saw before. Please. <laughs> I've read and reread and reread. Me and re too, read until I Bible. found it. It says in Genesis chapter 2, it says, When the Lord God made the earth heavens, no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. Why? Because the Lord God had not allowed it to rain on the earth. Why? Because there was no man to manage the earth. <laughs> now, that's a verse you and I that's never saw. Marvelous. <laughs> this is powerful to me. First of all, God had a beautiful planet, but he didn't allow anything to grow, nothing to spring forth, nothing to emerge, nothing to prosper, because oh, there was, was there. no manager. <laughs> okay, a few things I learned from this. Number one, God will never allow growth where there is no management. Wow, wow, wow. So instead of praying for things from God, pray for the management ability. God, secondly, God will withhold things from you if you cannot manage them. Notice it he says, withhold things. Read it. it says he didn't allow it to rain yeah. because there was no man to manage the results. So the next verse says, and therefore God formed the man from dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the bread of life. In other words, God had a beautiful planet. No life was on it. Why? Because he first needed a manager. Normally we ask people, why did God create man? Our answer, to worship God. That's not what he says. He needed a manager. <laughs> I have so never the number heard one, that. I love that. <laughs> the number one motivation for God creating man is management. Whatever you mismanage, you will lose. That is powerful. That's why management is so important in this process. Whatever you do not manage, you lose. In other words, God will never give you what you pray for. He will only give you what you can manage. You pray for a new house, and God's looking at the apartment that's unkept. So he only gives you what you've proven you could manage. Some people get jealous of your ministry, but they don't understand the machinery behind this ministry to manage all that's necessary here. So and the day you mismanage this ministry, you will lose it. Absolutely. That's if you right. mismanage your body, you lose it. If you mismanage your marriage, you lose it. If you mismanage your children, you lose them. If you mismanage your money, it goes away. When you think about the present crisis in the world today, some CEOs mismanaged uh, the process of mortgage uh, uh, qualification. And what happens? The whole world has been destroyed. When you mismanage anything, you lose it. And so in crisis, Crisis is a result of mismanagement. And the way you correct a crisis is management. So I have a list in the book of what the Lord taught me about management. And I want to read this to you. Well, there's, a, there, there's a chapter called The Management Mandate. Please read it. Because if people don't learn to manage, they will keep losing what they receive. Let's talk about the ways to manage. Crisis. Number one, yeah. determine what you need. You know, there's a difference between needs and wants right now. Sometimes we desire things we want over and above things we need. And crisis sometimes comes to reduce you back to what you need. Number two, acquire only what you need. Please repeat what you just said. God crisis comes to reduce you to what you need again. Some of us got five rooms in, a, in our house. We sleep in one. And we can't pay for the house. God will allow a crisis to foreclose on that house because you are living in this house, not sleeping with your family. Your children are in disarray because you work so hard to keep this house and you lose the home. So God will cause you to have your home repossessed to bring you back to the basics, relationships, family, love. Patience, kindness, goodness. We Sometimes we curse the Christ and God is saying, no, it's me. 
a lot of people for the first time right now are finally recognizing their spouses. Why? They lost their job. They finally got to talk to each say, other. Say what you said yesterday, that God is the one who actually causes those questions. You know, we normally say that it's the devil. Do you know God actually destroyed the economy of Egypt in order to promote a young man who was in prison? Yeah. Let me say it again. God caused a national crisis in Egypt because there was a man in prison he wanted to make prime minister. Every crisis produces promotion. Don't be afraid of them. Sometimes the only way for God to move from where you are is to create a crisis that demands movement. You know, Joseph was in prison, locked away, and it was a crisis, a threat of economic collapse in Egypt. God said there'll be famine. I'm going to destroy all of the crops of Egypt for seven years. There'll be famine. That's a crisis. Well, how did God get Joseph out of prison? Joseph had the answer to the crisis. This crisis we're going through now economically in America, in Canada, in England, in China, in Russia, in, in the United States, in South America, whatever it is, this is the greatest moment for promotion. This is when your gift comes alive. Joseph used to work in the courts of Pharaoh as a prince. That wasn't his gift. But Joseph's gift came alive. The gift of seeing the future, explaining dreams, when a crisis came. You know, your ministry right now is becoming more important because the stress in the world is causing more sickness and disease. Benny Hinn ministry must become the most powerful ministry now because people are getting sick. This is no time for you to, to hold back and say, not pray for the people. No way. People okay. are stressed. And so when you, when you talk about overcoming crisis, you have to look at the fact, in this book I talk about this, that people need to get back to what they need. You know, some of you, uh, you had five cars. You only drive one. This is the time now to get back to the reality. Look, I only need maybe one or two cars. I don't need five cars. Number three. Don't live beyond your ability. There are people who are trying to compete with other people to make it in life, and they are hurting themselves and their families. Crisis comes to shake you back to what's important, what's valuable. Number four, withdraw from the unnecessary. There are things that you are involved in that you can't sustain anymore. So withdraw from those things. There are organizations and, and maybe publications and maybe there are groups that you are part of. And that applies to more than just money. Absolutely. Sure. In other words, you may be involved in some clubs that demand fees that you can't pay anymore. Be willing to give that up. Why? Life is more important than a club. You've got to get back to loving your family, taking care of your wife, your children, your, your husband, uh, uh, to think your faith in God. God will always reduce you to Him. Wow, I love that. Say that again. This is powerful. He'll reduce you to Him. That's why He brings crisis. God allows crisis to bring you back to Him. Pharaoh actually thought he was a God until God created a crisis of famine. Uh, he brought locusts. He brought blood in the water. When Moses started bringing those points of crisis, Pharaoh had to admit that there is a God greater than he was. Sometimes we become so prosperous, we forget God. And God begins to withdraw things to reduce us to him. That's what happened to Hezekiah. Absolutely. And it happens to people right now. You know, number five, delay major projects. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes crisis comes to readjust our dreams. You, sometimes we, we are so passionate, we lose compassion. I've seen leaders who are so passionate, God told me to do this, and they forget to have compassion. And God would strip them of all the resources to bring them back to him and to the real issue, which is the people. Amen. Some ministers are so committed to pursuing their vision, forget the people to who fulfill it. Every partner in this ministry today, I want to tell you, we need you more than ever before. 
And if we ever make you feel as leaders that we are using you, forgive us. Yeah. We are partners together. And we are only what we are because of you. We can never forget you. This is why we pray for you. This is why these prayer requests are here. Because God will reduce us to the necessities. We need one another. Amen. A crisis comes to readjust us. To delay those large, big, glorious projects at the expense of compassion for people. Some people are building big buildings right now. God is saying, look, uh, you've been hurting the people in the process of building the building. Let's put the building on hold and get back to the people. See, I'm going to say it again. Passion should never become more important than compassion. Amen. It's very important that this crisis is used to bring us back to the basics. And even the government of your country, this great country, America, is being brought back to the fundamentals. God is saying, look, you cannot do this without me. Your smartest economists are confused. All the books you studied in Yale and Harvard are useless today. Why? Because the entire system, a crisis upsets all the known systems. It destroys traditions. So everything you learn becomes useless. And in this book about overcoming crisis, I talk about leadership. You know, leadership emerges out of crisis, true leadership. And you never grow in good times. We never change in good times. How true that is. Whatever you tolerate, you can never change. And that's why crisis comes to shake up the things you tolerate, to say, look, find a new way to do it. You know, I loved what you said yesterday. Yes. Like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. What made them famous? A crisis. crisis. Think Everybody about in the Bible went through crisis. Everybody in history is known for crisis. Pastor Benny Hinn, when I think of you, I don't think about your healing crusades. I think about when I read your story of when you left the Middle East and went to Canada and became bankrupt and your ministry started with just four people and how you grew that little church and, and, you know, and how you was fighting for people to believe you and how you were trying to have a healing ministry and no one... That's what I remember. That's what makes me trust you. 10,000 people in an auditorium doesn't impress me. It's what you went through to get there. You know, Jack Hayford said to me one day, he said, he said, you know why we believe God has called you? And I said, and I, of course, was quite stunned by his question. Mm -hmm. He said, not the miracles, not even all those who are saved. That's right. He said, your longevity. Absolutely. And it, it was a shocking kind Absolutely. of answer. Yes. Because we always think it's the miracles, it's the crowds, it's the great whatever. And it's really not. In this book, I talk about it. Crisis is the cradle of character. You know, we get characters, and then we get character. When you study people in history who are well-known, starting all the way back from Abraham, and you study all the great leaders, even Dwight Eisenhower, he was created out of the, third world, of the Second World War. Great leaders come out of the furnace of crisis. We're going to remember those who went through crisis. History is not a record of good things. History is a record of the people who survived crisis. Like Martin Luther King Jr. All of them. Yeah. You think about Mahatma Gandhi. Yeah, who was How do we know this man four feet two feet, four feet two inches high? The guy defeated the great British Empire with a conviction, not with a bullet. How do we remember Peter? We remember Peter because Peter <laughs> failed. He denied Jesus and came back and became the pastor of the church. Why do we remember John, the Isle of Patmos? Yes, sir. How he came back and wrote the book of Revelations in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. How do we remember Joshua? Because of Jericho. How do we remember Deborah? Because of the battles. How do you remember Esther, the little girl? Because she walked in at the expense of being killed in the presence of a king. Crisis guarantees your space in history. And if you've lost your job, people are now watching. How are you going to come out of that? Say what you said yesterday about your job 
and your call. Oh, that's so important. You know, the chapter in here, it's called Discovering Your Work Beyond Your Job. And in this book, I talk about some things that are very critical right now because people are losing their jobs. There's a difference between being employed and being deployed. Let me read this. It says, your job is what you were trained to do, but your work is what you were born to do. Your job is your career. Your work is your life's assignment. Your job is your skill. Your work is your gift. You can be fired from your job. You can never be fired from your work. That's right. You can retire from your job. You can never retire from your work. Jobs are temporary. Work is permanent. You know, you can never retire from being a, a healer of the sick. Of the sick. As an, look, I, I looked at my father, Al Roberts, on the program last week. And, I, you know, he's my spiritual father. Of course. And every word he speaks, you can still hear seed faith coming out. You can still hear uh, the, the, the healing ministry coming out. Why? He will never lose that. He didn't retire from that gift. That gift is with him until he leaves the earth. So if you lost your job today, the good news is you haven't lost your work. I was talking to a lady who came to me in my office, and she said, Pastor Miles, I lost my job. I've been at my job for 23 years, and they actually laid me off because of the crisis. And she was crying, and I said, what are you crying for? I said, wipe your tears. She said, why? I said, I said, do you have a house? She said, yes, I'm paying rent. I said, do you have a car? She said, yes, I'm paying a note. I said, is there an oven in your house? She said, yes. How many times do you use it? She said, once a week, every Sunday, I use my oven. I said, your problem is you don't have a, a lack of a job. You have a lack of thinking. I said, why don't you go home, take your oven, get some flour, some water, and some oats, make some cookies, and turn your oven into a production center. Make cookies. I said, and first of all, when you make them, go back to the place you were working and all your, your family. Give them the cookies free first. Why? Because you always plant your seed first. I said, and then when they want more, you simply bake more. In six months, this woman ended up with a cookie business. <laughs> a year later, she is now providing not only jobs for 120 people, she has a cookie factory. She had to buy uh, uh, the commercial ovens. She now has a cookie business. And she is now worth over a million dollars. She lost her job and never lost her work. Her gift was actually cooking, baking cookies. And it took losing a job to become a millionaire. Well, I pray the Lord. That's the good news. I pray the Lord will get this truth to you. You can never lose your call. Never. They can take your job. They can't yes. take your work. Never. This book, Dr. Miles Monroe, is full of wisdom. And I'm glad he is with me on the program again today. I have been so blessed listening to him, and I know you have too, on overcoming crisis, how to manage crisis. I'm telling you, you really are a blessing to all of us. Thank you. You and I have been friends a long time. Yes, precious. Yeah. As you know, he's from the Bahamas. The place where God lives. You, you, you <laughs> always say that, and I like hearing it. Uh, and yesterday and Monday, we talked about overcoming crisis, and, and I, you, 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 you said some powerful things. Yes. But yes. I want to talk about something else today, but let me just, one more time, real quick. Tell, what, uh, tell the precious people watching what you said about crisis, that God sends them, yes. that they are not forever, they are right. seasonal. And there's probably somebody right now going through some painful experience. Yes. Would you look at the camera there, Dr. Moreau? A crisis is an experience, an event, a circumstance that affects you or your environment over which you have no control. Crisis began in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. The whole program fell apart. Notice God did not panic because there's no crisis in the kingdom of God. God knows the end from the beginning and so whatever happens 
God is always aware it was going to happen or he himself instigated it. And so the present global crisis that is causing great unsettling around the world, people losing their jobs, properties being repossessed, houses being foreclosed, companies shutting down, other companies going into bankruptcy, whatever you're experiencing, whether it's in the United States or Africa or Europe, South America and the Caribbean where I'm from, I am here to tell you that whatever you're facing, the good news is to everything there's only a season. And to every purpose there's only a time. Yeah. Notice that this crisis therefore has a shelf life. It cannot last. So the key to overcoming crisis is first of all to understand it is temporary. So the conditions that you're going through now, do not panic. You know, when you commit suicide physically, that is usually because you try to give a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Don't commit suicide. It isn't worth killing your life over something that will change. Whatever you're going through, maybe your house is being repossessed and you got to move back in with your parents. Hey, that's only temporary. And what I like about God is that every crisis that he brings you through, you always come up with a promotion. You know, when Daniel came out of the lion's den, he was promoted. When Esther came out of the king's presence, she became queen. Amen. When Joseph came out of prison, he became prime minister. I wonder what he got in store for you. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Crisis is God's incubator for character development and promotion. So the key to overcoming crisis is to outlast them because they cannot remain forever. Outlast them. I love yes. it. I'm getting wow. excited already. Oh, I love it. This is oh, so good. glory. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Your other book, The Principles and Benefits of Change. What is that about? Because we'll discuss that You today. know, this book took me 30 years to write this one, The Benefits of Change. Change is one thing that is permanent in life, and yet people are afraid of it. The only thing you can guarantee in life is change. There's nothing as permanent or sure as change. Change is actually inevitable. So if change is a constant, the key to life then is to learn how to manage and benefit from change. Change is beautiful. For example, I say this often that there can be no improvement without change. And yet not all change is improvement. For example, if you used to weigh 110 pounds and now you weigh 170, that was a change. But it's not an improvement. It can actually be a threat to your health. But if you want to improve, you have to change. And God is a God of change, even though God never changes. And only two things Say that in life. again, so that is powerful. Yes. One more time. God is a God of change. He is the God of change. But God never changes. Why is he a God of change? Because everything God does is always temporary. He never does the same thing twice. No miracle in the Bible was ever repeated. God never healed anyone the same way twice. God is too creative to remain a constant. God is permanent, but he never does anything the same way twice. So you got to get used to change. And change is the most beautiful thing in the world. Because change means that you are never going to be bored in life when you keep company with God. You know what is amazing? I heard this years ago. Yes. Every snowflake is different. Absolutely. Every, uh, your, your fingerprint is not the same as mine. Yes. God is the God of variety. Absolutely. Yes. And do you know that uh, we hate change because change threatens our security. And our security is what traps us. Nothing is more dangerous to self-destruction than comfort. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is why, you know, Ecclesiastes 3 says this. It says, to everything there's a season. Then it says there's a time to be born and a time to die. 
There's a time to laugh and a time to mourn. We love the laughter part. But we forget that there's going to be a change where sometime we got to cry. We love the part where it says we gather. But what about the part where it says we scatter? You know, change comes into your life to remind you that nothing is permanent. You've got to learn, therefore, to live life very loosely. Don't hold on to anything too tightly. That's why God has the principle of change in life. So comfort, go back to the danger of comfort. The danger of comfort and security is it traps you from development and growth. Whenever God wanted to do something great, he always upset comfort. Because the only way for God to take you where you're supposed to be is to get you to leave where you are. And where you are is secure. And where you are is secure. Change produces two things. It produces insecurity and the unknown. And both of them are very important for growth and development. But people are always afraid. I know. And we are afraid because we expect things to remain the same. Like I said earlier, the most important approach to dealing with change is to expect it. We expect things to remain the same, and so we set ourselves up for disappointment. The way you benefit from change is you expect it. I like what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3, verse, verse 4. It says, there's a time to laugh and a time to mourn. When the morning time comes, I like the Bible says, uh, uh, we may mourn for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, why did you write this book? To help people what? I wrote this book because people keep destroying themselves, self-destruction, because they treat change as an enemy. When in fact enemies, the enemy is comfort. The enemy is security. But God wants us to have security. Our only security is in God and he doesn't change. <laughs> See, Ezekiel says, verse Chapter 34 says, I will bless them and the place surrounding the hill. I will send down showers and seasons, and there will be showers of blessings. You know, we believe that we're supposed to be blessed all the time, all the time, every day. God says, no, I send down blessings and showers of seasons. There's a season that you may go through a difficult period, but that is to wake up your ability to change. Seasons of change provide some things. Let me, let me give you what I wrote about in this book. Very important. First of all, change means that nothing remains the same. Seasons means that everything is always temporary. Seasons also means that the key to life is outlasting a season. Change also means that seasons are an incentive for you to plan for the future. You know, nothing happens unless you change. So change is not our enemy, it's our friend. You know, I think about, I think about uh, every time God wanted to use someone, he would disturb their comfort. Abraham was brought up in a home with his father, his mother, his family. God says, okay, I want to do something great with you. Leave your parents and your home. That's discomforting. And then Abraham asked him, where are we going? God says, I'll tell you when you get there. That's the unknown. But look how great Abraham has become. I think with Moses, Moses was comfortable being a prince in Egypt. He had the access to all the wealth and power of Egypt. And here comes a change. God gave him a passion for delivering people. And that act of deliverance made him a fugitive. And that change took him to the desert, which gave him the privilege of meeting God by a burning bush. All these changes introduced him to being a coming a deliverer. You cannot become what you were born to be unless you are not willing to change into something you are not. This is why change is so important. Uh, I like what it says here. Uh, Shakespeare says, sweet are the uses of adversity. Does God use crisis that's to his, move you out of your comfort zone? That's the purpose for change. Yes. You know, we never grow in good times. We never advance unless we're under pressure. 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 Change comes to improve and to advance your life, not to destroy you. 
And so I think you know, right now there are changes taking place in the world we don't understand. In this book, I talk about the fact that God is changing the whole uh, scenario of the world. God is shifting the, the earth right now from west to east, from south to north. The church, for example, God is changing the church. The western church is shifting to the eastern church, and the northern church is shifting to the southern May church. May I ask why? Because the season has come. The greatest churches in the world are now going to be coming from South America and Africa. It's happening already. Absolutely. And in this book, I talk about what do you do when change begins to happen to you? You know, what do you do? You can hate change, resist change. You can, you can become angry at change, but you cannot stop change. And what I believe, are you supposed to do when change? You're supposed comes? to understand change and adjust to change and then accommodate change and then manage it. You know, let me give you an important uh, point this I make in this book. In this book. <clears throat> if, if you've always been in charge, but now it's time for you to be a partner, that becomes a difficult change. Some of the church leadership in the world, in the Western world, are now having to admit that they are no longer the leaders. The leaders are now emerging from South America. They're emerging from Africa. You know, there's a church in Nigeria, my friend, uh, Brother David Ayedipu, Bishop yeah. Ayedipu. His church building seats 52,000 people. That's a Sunday morning service, one service. In America, you have a church of 10,000, you think it's a great church. His church is Sunday morning, 52,000 members, and about 100,000 outside. God is shifting. So what do you do? When do you say, okay, unless you sing American songs, dress like Americans, or do American sermons, then you can't be accepted. No, God is shifting. And you've got to understand that what God is doing, He is doing it without your permission. Exactly. God doesn't consult anyone when He wants to change. He wants you to consult Him. What happens in people's lives when change comes? What should they do? Well, repeat what you just said earlier. They should what now? You know, if winter comes, but you decide, I hate winter, and you put your swimming suit on, and you stand in the snow, and you defy winter, winter will kill you. Exactly. In other words, when change comes, you change your clothing. You adapt to it. Don't defy it. Don't fight it. Don't curse it. You learn and understand it, and then you accommodate that change and find your place in it. Every change that God does, you have a role in it. But you can resist it, and it can destroy you. I like what God says in the book of Isaiah. He says, Behold, I do a new thing. Will you not know it? Okay, now let me ask you something. How do you know the season has come for change? Because, you know, it's amazing. It's a very good question. I do a whole chapter in the book on that. What to, how to recognize seasons of change. And to know it's God. Of course. Yeah. Number one. When what you are doing is no longer effective, it's time to change. When the people around you begin to become an irritation instead of a blessing, it's time for change. When all your efforts seem to be causing more stress on you than causing blessings and fulfillment, it's time to change. In other words, when winter comes, everything cooperates with it. What I'm saying is very important. Yeah, very. When, when a season comes, everything cooperates with it. So when winter comes, the leaves fall, the bear goes into a cave, the trees lose all their leaves, you begin to see uh, different plants going into recession, they're preparing for the change. When a change is taking place, things that were against you suddenly become for you. People that said no before will now say yes. Change can be that dramatic. You know, tradition is the greatest enemy of change. And tradition is not bad. This is very important, tradition. Yeah. Repeat that. This is so very important. You know, Pastor Benny, one day I was reading the Bible and I read about a guy named Sam. You know Sam. Sam was a very powerful guy, muscular, strong guy. 
He was well he known Sam, okay. for his great feet. We know him as Samson. Yes. I think <laughs> Sam would be Samuel, Samson. Joshua would be Joshua. <laughs> Go ahead. And I read the story about Samson. He was in the desert. He met a thousand Philistines. They came to kill him. Samson is standing there in the heat of the sun. The sand is hot and he see a thousand men coming to kill him. They come with spears and daggers and swords and shields and horses. And Samson looks around, he's in trouble, and he sees a white bleached jawbone of a donkey. He reaches over, picks it up, shakes the sand out of it, and it has two teeth left in it. And Samson braces himself, and the thousand Philistines come. He begins to swing that jawbone. Men fall, horses spill over. He kept swinging. And after a few hours of swinging, 1,000 men lie dead on the sands of the desert. And Samson is standing there breathing, blood all over his body, splattered all over his hands. And he has in his hands a jawbone bleached white, soaked with red blood. And Samson just saw a miracle. He killed a 1,000 men with a jawbone of a donkey. That was impressive to me. But what blew my mind was, it says, one simple statement, it says, and when Samson had killed the Philistines, Samson threw away the jawbone. That changed my life. Mm. You see, we use things in life that worked, they were successful. If that was me and you, and we used that donkey's jawbone, we would have taken that, patented it. That's exactly. We have taken it, registered to the Library of Congress. We have gone to a manufacturer, make a prototype. We have actually made a lot of these jawbones and called them Samsonite. Or something. We have like made them a war weapon. Yep. And we would trade them to other armies and say, "Look, it works. I've proved it. These can kill a thousand Philistines." And we would actually sell them as war weapons. Follow me carefully. We would then trade this jawbone, trade it as a weapon to the future armies. We would trade this jawbone. Why? It worked for us. Look at the word trade. Tradition. Oh, yeah. Tradition is taking a thing that worked for you and giving it to the next generation. That's what it is. Samson knew that even though that jawbone worked for him, the anointing left it. And he threw it away. How true. Can you throw away success? Yes. Because you could become so preoccupied by your own success, it can stop you from going to your next success. That's powerful. Tradition is frozen success. Oh, you're a God that's powerful. Tradition is when what your experience of God was, you believe it should be your children's experience also. Frozen success. That's tradition. Man. Traditions are not bad, but they can become useless if the anointing has left them. So you've got to learn to be willing to change. In this book, I talk about how to recognize... You know, some denominations need to hear this. Some churches and pastors need to hear this because you see some of them dead in an old move. You know, the crisis comes to destroy traditions. That's why crises are good. Everything... Man, that made the American economy work for the past 50 years has been confused. The church is the same way. Many churches are dying right now. Large churches are slowly dying because the things that they used for the last 20 years are no longer appropriate. And God is saying, look, the anointing has left the job boom. Don't be angry. That is a powerful line. The anointing has left the job. Absolutely. You know, the hardest thing in the world to do is to throw away something that worked. I want to preach a sermon on that. Yes, you got my permission. My God, that's powerful. Yes. So change comes to make tradition obsolete. This is why much of what you're doing stops working. It's not that it wasn't good or it wasn't successful but the anointing has left it you know I heard a man of God years ago say when you have to push it it needs to die absolutely yes 
Yes. And Samson was smart enough to know that the anointing left the jawbone. And he never tried to sell it to another generation. This, all this and more is in this book. Let me talk about this one first, Overcoming Crisis. Yes. You, you ministered oh. on this yesterday and Monday was powerful. I want to send you this book for $30, and this is the only place you can get it right now. Yes. It will be in bookstores later. But right on this show is the first public release of both of these books. And by the way, Dr. Miles Monroe has donated a thousand of each yes. to our ministry, and that's all we have. So the first thousand, thousand, when they go, it's gone. The next book, Benefit of Change. Yes. You know what? I'm, I am going to read this one. Every pastor needs this book. Every businessman needs this book. Every investor needs this book on change. Because if we don't change our traditions, keep in mind, tradition and truth are different. Truth never changes. Tradition is your experience with truth. God never did anything in the world twice. I'm going to ask you to do something. Tonight you're ministering in my class. Would you teach on this? Yes, I'd be happy to then do Then I will air more of this later. Very key. This is very powerful. Anyways, also this is a new book. Yes. That's not out in stores yet, but it will be. This is the only place you can get it now. Both books for $50. Get it today. Wow! <laughs> this is good. Brother, I love it. Dr. Miles Monroe is with me today, and I'm so glad he is. He just wrote a book on overcoming crisis and anytime he writes a book I get very excited because you have so much to tell the church I mean your teaching on the kingdom is there's nothing like it thank you you are tops and I see USA Today best-selling author sir yes. wow fine God it's yes good to sir. Be back. well it's <laughs> nice to have you back let's begin talking about overcoming crisis well, now, what, what do you mean by crisis? Financial, global, our crisis with family, or all you the know, above? The whole world today is talking about crisis. Yeah. And, uh, of course, uh, this is a global crisis. As a matter of fact, I think that the real crisis in the world today is globalization. Because historically... What do you mean by globalization? I mean, let me explain right now. Please, sir. Historically... When a country had an economic problem, it was simply that country's problem. So you go back as far as the 1930s when the Great Depression took place, uh, you know, there were isolated experiences of depression around the world. If the economic conditions in one country fall apart, it didn't affect other nations. But today, because the whole world is so interdependent, when something happens in any country, it affects all the countries. For example, the present global crisis economically taking place was purported to have been started by some decision makers in the field of real estate in the United States. And it ended up impacting France, Germany, Italy, London, and now all the world. But now words, why, why did you write this book? This book was written because People are beginning to panic. And crisis is any situation, circumstance, or condition that affects your environment and your life over which you have no control. People, for example, watching this program, many of your partners, they're losing their jobs, losing their houses, losing their 401ks. They are losing their savings. They are having to abandon their businesses. And, be, and they have no control over it. And so they feel like the whole world is imploding on them. And that's called a crisis. Well, in this book, I wanted to show that a crisis is not as negative as you think it is. Whenever God wanted to do something powerful or great, he didn't only look for crises, he created them. For example, when God wanted to promote... God created crisis. Yes. Matter of fact, the word crisis is a word that we created. We use it to, des to describe things we cannot understand or cannot control. We invented the word crisis. Uh, God never calls anything a crisis. So our semantics, our terminologies 
are the problem. For example, in this book, I talk about the fact that whatever you call a thing, that is what it is to you. Now, let's deal with why would God do that. Whatever you call a thing, that is what it is to you. Okay. So if you call it a crisis, then it controls your response to it. In the word of God, God never calls anything a crisis. Case in point. Let's think about Daniel and the lion's den. If you were threatened today to be thrown into a cave of wild lions, you would call that a crisis. But God was relaxed because God set up the whole thing. He actually designed the whole environment for Nebuchadnezzar and all of that to prove that you can turn lions into a sleeping mat. Another thing about a crisis, the only thing you are known for in life are the things you overcame. Boy, that is Crisis powerful. is the recording of history. We put it another way. History is a record of crisis. You only know people because of crisis. Martin Luther King Jr., we know him because of the crisis he went through. Nelson Mandela, it was the crisis. These are unknown people without crisis. Let's go back to Abraham. It was a crisis. Barren, not even have a child. That's a crisis. Uh, uh, how about uh, Daniel? How do we know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yeah. These were unknown exactly. Jewish boys, but a fiery furnace made them famous. This is the <laughs> hour right <laughs> now where what you're going through, God has allowed it so that you can never be forgotten in history. You know, what made Jesus famous? It was a crisis. A cross so. became a crisis, and now we can't forget it. So crises are simply situations that either God created or God allows to prove that he is bigger than circumstances and to also make sure that history can't forget you. And how, what happens to the individual? You know, when a person faces a situation that we call a crisis, your interpretation of a crisis is what makes it a crisis. You know, Paul the Apostle says something important. Paul says... All things work together for my good. Yeah. Now, that sounds like a nice statement, but that's a tough statement. Someone just lost their job watching this program. They just got a pink slip, and they're supposed to say, this is working for my good. Well, if they don't understand how God uses crisis, it could become a point of depression. You know, I have a little list in the book. I talk about what crisis create. Uh, let's look at a few of them. Yeah, please. The loss of a job could be a crisis. The death of a child is a crisis. The death of a spouse, the collapse of a business, the, the, the terminal disease that's in a body is a crisis. Uh, a divorce, that's a crisis for someone. Loss of a home, a repossession by the bank, that's a crisis. An unmarried pregnant daughter could be a crisis to someone. A drug addict child, that's a crisis for someone. A death of a parent. In other words, crisis is not just economic conditions. It's anything that happens to you that you couldn't control or you couldn't stop. And what, what is the impact of a crisis? Fear, trauma, depression, despair, frustration, anxiety, loneliness, abandonment, worry, hopelessness, a sense of loss, even the threat of suicide. These are the impact of crisis on a person's body on a person's life. Even crime and domestic violence are products of crisis. Many people today are under stress in their homes because if the husband lost his job, let's say, uh, you know, GM you know, shut down the plant, and the husband lost his job, he's the only one working, imagine the stress in that family, in that of home. Course. See, and you tell that person, well, believe in God. They need more than just belief in God. They need some practical uh, uh, principles and precepts to know what to do and in this book, that's what we do. Then talk. let's help many of them right now Absolutely. watching, please. You know, the first thing you've got to understand about a crisis is that a crisis is only seasonal. I think one of the most beautiful things that God ever taught me is that nothing is forever except Him and His promises. Would you look at the camera and tell someone that who's going through some pain? Yes. You know, the joy of life is that God gives us life in doses. The Bible says as long as the earth remains, There'll be harvest and seed time. There'll be good time and bad time. There'll be summer and winter. Um, unlike what the scriptures say too, it says to everything there is a season. In other words, nothing lasts forever. 
If you are broke right now, that's only a season. It cannot last. Wealth is on the way. And if you are wealthy right now, you must use that wealth strategically and properly because there will come a time when that wealth may be challenged. In other words, everything is for a season. And the good thing is that if you are in a dungeon right now, light is on the way. If you are in pain right now, health is on the way. If you are abandoned right now, a company is coming to meet you. You see, nothing remains forever. And that's the joy Beautiful. of a crisis. Yeah. What, what you're going through right now cannot last. You know, it's amazing. Please say that again. I think somebody really needs to hear Absolutely. this one more time. Nothing in life lasts forever except God. This is why even, that's really even your marriage will go through seasons. You know, I tell people all the time, uh, if your husband or wife is not doing well right now, don't divorce them. Why? That's a temporary insanity. Oh, well, I said it again. They are going through a season of insanity. It can't last. Have you gone through that? Everyone in marriage goes through that. I've been married for 30 years this year, and it's been wonderful. Same here. And you know something? The issue in life is remaining steady until the season passes. Can I say it again? Yeah, please. The key to success in life is outlasting the season. And that could be a season of good time or bad time. Here's something I learned. I talk about it in the book. And that is the greatest protection against crisis is to expect it. Now, you may think that's negative. <laughs> I like that. Brother, you are blessing me right now. So we are to expect it. Well, let me put it this way. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. tribulation. Yes. See, we love to claim selective promises. Yeah. And that's our problem. We, we, we like to claim things like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We claim things like, my God shall supply all my needs. Well, of course. We claim things like, whatever I put my hands to shall prosper. Well, claim this one, you shall suffer persecution. <laughs> Nobody ever claims that's that That's a promise. In this world, you shall suffer many tribulations. As a matter of fact, Jesus said something about Christ. He says, if you follow me in my kingdom, he says, and you believe my word, he promises now, he says, you will be like a man who built his house on a rock. The storm come, the winds blew, the waves rose, and the great clash hit the house, yeah. and it stood firm. He says, if you don't follow my word, it's like a man who built his house on the sand. The winds blew, the storms rose, the waters came, and that house fell. Which now, means he was telling us. Hang on, don't get ahead of me. See, we who are in the kingdom that. of God, we believe that we are immune to crisis. Yeah. So we got a, someone listening to this program right now to say, well, I paid my tithes, I went to church, I was faithful, why did I lose my job? Well, he did say that the wind would hit all houses. Yeah, he did. Because you are a believer, doesn't, wow. doesn't insulate you from storms. But he does guarantee your house won't fall. Well, I tell you, you're ministering to me right now, so I'm listening to every word. So the, the, the key is not whether you have a crisis or not. The key is what are you built on. Yeah, and absolutely. in this book I talk about you overcome crisis by making sure that you understand the principles and the precepts of God's word so that when the storms come, the storm doesn't come to destroy you. It comes to prove what you're built on. Now go back to what you said earlier. You expect it, you said. Yes. Okay. The greatest protection against disappointment is the but expectation may I ask of change. You, how many storms must we expect a year? <laughs> Listen, how many storms do you expect? One? I, I, I want one. I don't want two. I want one a year. You know, one of the things I believe... Actually, I don't really want any, but uh, if, know, if I'm supposed to have one, at least one a year, no more. You know... All of life is a series of crises. I like what the, the Asians do when they have a crisis. Did you ever wonder why the Chinese and the Japanese always emerge out of crisis victoriously? Second World War, the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. Right. The Japanese came back and actually became the most powerful exporters of products to the United States and actually brought an imbalance in the trade balance in the United States. They came out of, of ashes and became the most powerful exporters of technology and cars to so America. So why? 
the Chinese. Every city you go into, you find that the Chinese always end up owning a business. Why? Because in the Japanese language and the Chinese language, there's no word for crisis. Really? As a matter of fact, the word for crisis in the Japanese language is the word opportunity. <laughs> wow. So when, so right now, in, look, look, look at the Chinese. I today. like that. The Chinese are traveling all over the world right now, and they are investing in all the countries while all the countries are saying crisis, crisis. They're saying opportunity, opportunity. So we're to change our mentality. Absolutely. And in the body of Christ, unlike what Jesus said, you know, when they told Jesus, Lazarus is dead, he says, oh, he's asleep. Now, whatever you call a thing, that's what it is to you. They say, he's dead. Christ says, he's asleep. What's the difference? If I say a person is dead, that means I cannot awake them. But if I say they are asleep, I can awake them. <laughs> so. This crisis you're going through right now, is simply asleep. You are coming out of this. God's going to bring us out of this crisis. We're going to be bigger than when we went into So it. when you come out, yes. what happens? When you come out, the, your test, your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. Oh, that's strong. Say that again. Your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. So no matter how much you brag and how much faith you have, the test that you're going through now will prove it. Beautiful. And this is why in the body of Christ, whenever you make a confession, Jesus said it must be tested. I remember Peter told Jesus, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll <laughs> die for you. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, you shouldn't yes. have said that. He says, Peter, Satan has now required you to be tested for the words you say. Is that why he said that to him? Satan has desired to... to sift you as yeah, wheat. I've always wondered about that. It is a principle. This is why when you, when you claim, I'm going to win a million souls to Jesus this year, Satan wakes up and says, I'm going to see if he means that. And he attacks your partners, he attacks your financial support, he attacks your staff, he attacks your family. Why? He's going to make sure, whether you believe that or not, whether it will stand, that you will still go after those souls. So whenever you make a confession in the body of Christ, you attract the testing of that confession. And this is why, and the, the, the problem with living in the kingdom of God is this. You cannot get things without confessing them. But when you confess them, they will be tested. Every true vision... That is so powerful. Yes. My Lord, that's powerful. So when we, we have to confess it. Absolutely. But when we confess it... It must be tested. It, it will be tested, yeah. yeah to see if so it's authentic. So the enemy is going to come and say, Okay, fella, Absolutely. you said by stripes I'm healed. I'm going to really see if you... If and this you is why it. sometimes people say to you and I, I was doing fine until I became a believer. And now I'm having all these problems. Well... The reason why I'm having those problems is because you, you decide to confess, I am following Christ. Jesus said, anyone who will live godly in Christ Jesus must suffer. But let me read a verse of scripture that we don't claim. John 16, verse 1. Jesus said these words. He says, these things I have spoken unto you, that you should not be offended when they happen. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he's doing God's service. These things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you before now so that... We and so if someone finds So when you say work, you mean calling? Absolutely, your gift. Yeah. Your gift is more important than your skill. Your skill is what they trained you to do. Your gift is what you were born with. And a lot That's of people powerful. today... Five million people lost their jobs since January. And I'm telling you on this show today on Benny and Show that God sent this ministry into your life to tell you right now that your job is not your life and your job is not your work. There's life after your job. Your job is what they pay you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. And if you lose your job, they can never take away your gift, your work. And your work is what makes you prosperous. Because your work is your gift. Oh, and the scripture fine. says that a man's gift makes room for him in the world. Not a man's job, his gift. So if you are unemployed today because you lost your job, 
God is telling you today, find your work. Your work will sustain you when you lose your job. Your gift will sustain you when you, sustain you, when you lose your skill. And the kingdom of God follows the spirit of gifting. This is why what you were born to do is more important than what you were trained to do. Listen, dear Dr. Miles Moreau has donated a thousand books only to our ministry. Yes. There's only one thousand of these. And of course, they're in bookstores too, or will be in bookstores, correct? This is the first place where they are being released publicly. Right in this here. show right now. Okay. So your partners and those who want it, if they call in right now and make a commitment, as a matter of fact, to support this ministry, we're going to give this book to them as a token of our appreciation for their supporting the Ben Hinn ministry. That's so sweet of you. For $30, a gift of $30, we'll send this to you. And then you have another book. Both of them are brand new. The Principles and Benefits of Change. Yes. What's, what's in this one? Ooh, that's the one that deals with the fact that change is a blessing, not a curse. And that we should maximize change, not be afraid of change. Now listen, each for 30, both for 50, call today. And this is, well now this book hasn't come out either yet. This is coming out at the end of the month, so they'll both be out this month. But this is the first place they can first get them. First place right they here. can get them, right here. Okay, call now, the number is on the screen, do it right away. Oh, this is powerful. I am really enjoying listening to you. You are always such a blessing. Thank you. You, you, you are a very, ins you inspire people. Thank you. No, me too. I mean, I love listening to you. It's called God breath. Some preachers To inspire are means to breathe Some preachers God's are breath. boring. You're, you're, you're not boring at all. Thank the images in this video are all real captured by NASA's Mars rovers, directly from the surface of the planet. This is the first time Martian footage has been rendered in stunning 4K resolution. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this journey across the surface of another world. The team at NASA has given Mars informal place names, which you will see on the screen in the bottom left corner. The footage was mainly captured by the three most successful rovers, Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity. The cameras on board the rovers were the height of technology when the respective missions were launched. A question often asked is, why don't we actually have live video from Mars? Although the cameras are high quality, the rate at which the rovers can send data back to Earth is the biggest challenge. Curiosity can only send data directly back to Earth at 32 kilobits per second. Instead, when the rover can connect to the Mars Renaissance orbiter, we get more favorable speeds of 2 megabytes per second. However, this link is only available for about 8 minutes each Sol or Martian day. As you would expect, sending HD video at these speeds would take a long time. As nothing really moves on Mars, it makes more sense to take and send back the images. In order to create a video like this, several images must first be stitched together to create a mosaic or panorama. Depending on how many images are connected, you may sometimes see black areas where no image was taken. 
We have done our best to preserve the 4K quality by not zooming in, while also trying not to include those areas, but you may see them from time to time. By taking these mosaics and panning across them at 60 frames per second, we have created the most lifelike experience of being on Mars. This image is the largest mosaic ever put together and was made from over 1,000 images taken by Curiosity between November 24th and December 1st, 2019. It contains 1.8 billion pixels. As we zoom in, the quality does not diminish. At this zoom level, what you are seeing is exactly 4K quality. The rover was exploring the area named Glen Torridon, which was theorized to contain large amounts of clay. Clay found on Mars signals the presence of water in the past. At this point in 2020, the NASA rovers have found irrefutable evidence that Mars was once a watery planet. You may be wondering why the sky color varies from image to image. The true color of Mars is reddish and hazy. In some images, however, the sky will appear blue and bright like on Earth. This is due to the recoloring of images done by NASA in order to aid geologists identifying rock formations. This technique also produces a much clearer picture, so we can see Mars in much greater detail. Curiosity is the only rover still active on Mars. The previous two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, unfortunately succumbed to the Martian environment. They were launched around the same time, landing on opposite sides of the planet. Twin rovers, they are considered one of NASA's most successful missions. Spirit became trapped in a sand dune and lost the ability to charge its solar panels after six years of service. Opportunity outlives Spirit, roaming Mars for 14 years and making astounding discoveries. Opportunity was lost in 2019 after experiencing a massive dust storm and essentially freezing to death.
NASA's newest rover, Perseverance, is scheduled to land in 2021. It will deploy a small helicopter called Ingenuity. Ingenuity will scout the path ahead, warning the team at NASA about any sand traps awaiting the rover. Flying on Mars is no easy feat. With an atmosphere much thinner than Earth's, its blades will reach up to 2,400 revolutions per minute. That's 40 spins every second. Most helicopters on Earth operate at just 500 revolutions per minute, which is just over 8 spins per second. This video was an exhibit of the high-quality images available of the Martian surface, which many people are unaware of. Click here to see the full journey of Curiosity and the things it actually discovered on Mars, or go and check out our other videos. Thanks for watching Elder Fox.